Okay. Chap Peterson, former state senator, Fairfax. Joe Morsi, former state senator, uh, Richmond, Petersburg area. Guys, uh, boy, the uh, fake news is on overdrive. You would think that uh, Kamala Harris was the greatest thing since sliced bread ever. Uh, we got fake polls coming out. And uh, but nobody's asking her a question. No press conferences. No, uh, no live anything. It's just basically teleprompter stuff. Chap, I mean, you've you've run tough races. You ran for statewide office. How do you run, how do you be a candidate for four w weeks and not do one presser? How's that work, Chap Peterson? <laughs> Well, that, first of all, John, thanks for having me on. Uh, yeah, it's been remarkable. I, I think, uh, you know, people tend to uh, say, well, the, the influence of the media and politics is exaggerated, but clearly it's not. I mean, they can kind of create their own boom and bust cycles. And just like they made the decision to get rid of uh, Joe Biden a couple months ago, uh, clearly they've gone all in on Kamala Harris, who, you know, just two months ago would have been described as a failed vice president and not someone who could survive on a national stage. But again, you know, she doesn't really have to do anything. I mean, she just reads off the teleprompter and, and, uh, and uh, you know, reads whatever notes that she has to do. And, and she's done that successfully. And, and you know, I think the, the real difference I've noticed is that the money has obviously been very strong for the Democrats. I mean, they've been up on air. I mean, I was watching the Olympics. It seems like a Kamala Harris commercial was running every five minutes. So, uh, you know, probably, you know, that was a good investment for her to, to get in on that right away. Now, having said all that, the election is still close. Um, you know, it's funny. Like I said, I cut my teeth, John, working on the Bill Clinton campaign in 1992, which was just a brutal campaign. And, of course, Bill went through you know, all the scandals and everything else early in the campaign. So by the time we got to the general, you know, people had kind of not been introduced, been heard the good, heard the bad, heard the middle. And so you had been through the ringer at that point. Um, there's been no ringer uh, for Kamala Harris yet. Um, having said that, and I know Joe will make this point, which is prescient, which is most people really aren't focused on the election. I mean, you know, they, it got the attention span when you had the, the complete debacle of a debate, and then there was all the pressure on Biden to step down. He did step down. And I would, it, I'm willing to venture that the average American has not seen or heard Kamala Harris more than, say, three seconds on a news clip. No one's ever actually seen her speak. No one's actually seen her debate. No one's met her or heard her speak at a rally. And I would say no one. I mean, um, small small groups of people. So she really hasn't been introduced on a national stage yet. And that may happen at the debate. It may happen at the convention. Uh, but it hasn't happened yet. Joe, Mo Mo Joe Morrissey, you want to weigh in? I do. John, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure to appear with you and Chap. First of all, I'm going to repeat what I said two weeks ago, four weeks ago, six weeks ago. Wait until after the Democratic National Convention when all the bumps for Kamala Harris have occurred and then, ha then look at a uh, prudent, uh, nationally recognized poll like Siena College, NBC, Wall Street to see where we are. Now, that's one point. Second point is you and Chap and I are an insular group because what we, we follow politics more than the average person. And because we're doing that now, when you started the show, John, by saying, you know, that Kamala's up in the polls and this and that, that makes you think that everybody is focused like you. And, and like Ch Chap just said, that's not occurring. Maybe 1% of the population is focused. Wait until we get to September 1. There are, there'll be 70 day, or I mean, 10 weeks before the election, and that's when um, uh, the rubber hits the road, and Kamala has had her bumps, and uh, both parties have been able to get out their message. The September 10th debate, uh, which uh, Harris has agreed to on ABC News, is in Pennsylvania. Trump then said, okay, uh, I'll go to that, yay, whatever. Um, also, I want you to do September 4, Fox News in Harrisburg, and then September 25th, I'll give you NBC, that's somewhere else. So. Uh, CNN, NBC, ABC, they'll, they'll all have a shot. Uh, so far, the Harris campaign has rejected that. They spent two weeks blasting Trump for not participating in the debate they wanted on September 10th with ABC. 
So they blasted him for that. Then he says, OK, and he re, re-ups her two debates. And then uh, the fake news doesn't say a word that she rejected that. What is up with that? Well, let me let me say this, Chop. I'll jump in here. Yeah, go ahead. First of all, whenever you see that an individual wants to debate, the general rule of thumb is they're behind. If they are up in the polls, if they are leading, if they are winning, they're not. They have no real inclination to debate. The fact that Trump is saying, I want to debate two, three more times, and I'm willing to concede to the September 10th debate, means that to me that his camp is more than just concerned about Kamala's rise in the polls. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that's self-evident. Yeah. But and, these and are presidential thing, debates. I mean, Clinton was way up. He, de- he debated Dole. I, re- I remember that two times. Uh, Barack Obama was way ahead. He, de- he debated Romney three times. So, I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not sure in the presidential race that holds water, chap. Well, I have to go back to 72 when Nixon refused to debate Govern, but McGovern. That's but, true. Uh, that's true. Uh, that's the only one I can think of. Look, at, at the end of the day, I think there was a narrative uh, up through June, up through really July, that people were unhappy. Joe Biden was old and out of touch, and Trump was had momentum. That was the narrative. Then Kamala was, you know, Biden got pushed out. Kamala stepped forward. She did a good job of, you know, when sort of all the controversy was circled around Biden of of not at least being perceived as the one who was putting pressure on him. So I think she conducted herself well in that in that stage. And then she stepped forward and suddenly all the Democrats like, oh, my God, we have a new younger uh, candidate. And and then the the story became, well, she's raising all this money. There's all this enthusiasm. So she was able to pivot away from kind of what was her record, what did she actually accomplish, what did she actually stand for. Um, I find it noteworthy that I think she was in Vegas over the weekend and endorsed what had been Trump's proposal to end taxes on tips, which is a brilliant idea. Um, and she adopted it, uh, you know, which that that's, that's how politics works. You can sort of take your take your uh, opponent's ideas if, if they're good ideas. Um, but apart from that, I, I can't really think of a single actual policy that she wants to promote. I mean, what, what, is, what is she recommending? What does she want to do as president? And, um, you know, she does have a record, which, again, I think would be somewhat concerning if, if you're someone that was a First Amendment uh advocate, you know, a religious freedom advocate, uh, she doesn't have a good record on those issues. Um, you know, the problem is, is that the Republicans have not really been coordinated any kind of message. The only thing that they did coordinate was on the, the Tim Waltz military issue, which, yeah, I mean, he, he kind of got over his skis on that, and they and they brought that up, and that's, that was an issue, and, and that issue, frankly, is kind of over, and it's on to the next thing. Um, you know, the Republicans really have to figure out if, the, if they're going to pull this off and, and then first of all they got to consider themselves the underdog they just have to um that's just the, the way the american you know electorate is shaped these days you just have to assume that if you're the republican candidate the other democrats going to have the money and they're going to have the media support and, and you have to recognize that um they, they need to kind of have a uh, a coordinated message about kamala saying you know this is who she is if she's president this is going to happen and they need to be coordinated about that uh, in a way that they probably haven't been so far. Joe, uh, at what point does uh, Harris have to account to her record? At what point does she have to start answering questions? As soon as the Trump campaign starts a wave, a volley of commercials focusing on the Democrats' poor energy policy, the economy, the wall, uh, foreign relations, she then is forced to respond. So what right now it's a feel good moment for the D's and for Kamala Harris. The transition from Biden to Kamala Harris was seamless. Uh, Tom Walls is a feel good governor. They raised $150 million in a short period of time. It's all feel good now. But when the camp, the convention ends and the Trump campaign begins, it's wave, and it's going to be a wave, I predict, 
like you've never seen before, showing the uh, failed policy of the Democrats over the last three, four years, then she's going to have to respond. And so I feel uh, that the last 10 weeks are necessarily going to be focused on those core uh, campaign issues that affect everybody, inflation, groceries, gas, energy, economy, the wall. And when that happens, you're going to see, again, I predict, I'm no soothsayer, uh, soothsayer, you're going to find uh, that uh, it comes real close. So, Joe, the, uh, the Las Vegas is running the campaign. You know Chris Las Vegas from Virginia, been around a long time, very astute, very good. Uh, he's the one that did this swift boat ads on John Kerry that uh, started the uh, started the Sinkus campaign right right at the start. He kind of killed it early, but they've decided to wait until after the Democratic convention, which I think is a good idea because they're like, look, we're never going to break through the fake news. Everybody's so wonderful it is. Let's just right. wait until that's over. Let's give them their convention. Uh, chap, you mentioned. Bill Clinton, I'll never forget, I've said this a hundred times on air, I'll never forget in 96, I went to uh, San Diego for the Dole Kemp Convention. I remember they asked Clinton, you know, what he thought of the whole thing. What, did he want to comment? He said, no, I'm not going to comment. I, I'm going on vacation. Let them have their convention. Hey, by the right. way, Republican San Diego is a beautiful city. Enjoy it. You'll have fun. It's a wonderful city. Have a great, con- have fun. And uh, I'll see you when we get back. We'll have a campaign then. I thought that was one of the best answers ever. He just went right, on vacation. Right. Screw it. Let them have their convention. They're they're going to l- lose any anyway. Go ahead and have it. And I never forget. He said, "And go have fun. It's a beautiful city." That was a great comment. So La Vida wants to wait until the after this convention's over. Do you agree with that st- strategy? I'll st- I'll start with Joe. Absolutely. Otherwise, it's wasted money. You might as well drive down Interstate 95 and throw the money out the window. It's a good <laughs> strategy. All right. And when you start, uh, not that either party is going to be short of funds, but remember this, you, when you were talking about vacations, consider the following, and I believe it to my core. If Trump or Kamala Harris went on vacation now until November, did nothing, did nothing, that person wins 46% of the vote. Okay, what we're fighting about is six to eight percent of independents, and what you're fighting about is in those swing states. So conserve your money, wait until their feel good moments are over in the convention, and then start what I call the real campaign. Chap? Yeah, I I think that's right. I mean, it it reminds me of that scene from Braveheart where the English cavalry is charging the Scots, and William Wallace is saying, hold, hold, hold. And uh, it's hard, I'm sure, you know, if you're watching the Olympics and you're a Trump supporter and you see, you know, one after another of these Kamala com- commercials probably pulling your hair out like, where's our commercials? Uh, but I agree with Joe. I mean, it, it, it's, it is pointless to try and, uh, you know, stand against the tide uh, because, you know, clearly she's going to get positive publicity or, you know, at this point for the next few weeks up to the Democratic convention. And then at some point the story becomes stale. You know, you, the thing about momentum is, by definition, you can only have it, you can't have it uh, interminably. And, you know, I, I think we've said this before, that on the issue, if the campaign is about issue, Trump wins. Because I, I, I do think that the issues as they're framed to the American public, he, he represents the majority viewpoint. Uh, if the campaign is about personalities, then he probably loses. Because he just, like I said, it's just it's sort of endemic that... You know, he turns tends to turn people off, and and uh, Kamala, like I said, she's done a good job about not talking too much, which is is a brilliant skill for a politician to have, and I congratulate her for that. Um, but and you know, I, chap, I, I might like to add, Trump ought to adopt. You right, uh, yeah, there's no doubt about that. Uh, that. That would be a good lesson for him to learn. But to get back to the to the to the key point, yeah, I, I agree. I think um, there will be a time and place where where. It's, it's going to be a dog fight. All right. Joe, you got the final word. Right. Prediction. There are going to be two major events between now and Election Day that will turn the campaign either way. We saw it in Trump's 16 election with Access Hollywood, and then the Jim Comey decided to reopen the Hillary Clinton investigation. 
two more major significant Chris that are going to affect, affect this election. There it is. But you don't. But you don't know what they are. No. No. All right. Not let me much. ask you guys one more. Just one more quick question. We'll we'll get back to it next week. Joe, do you think this assassination attempt on Trump was a setup or just incompetence? Did you? I'm. It's a little noisy. I'm in Charleston, South Carolina. Did you just say was it contrived, a setup? Yes. Oh, that's ridiculous. Sure. The president, of, the former president of the United States, that says, "Listen, have a guy from 450 feet away take a shot at me, at me, take part of my ear off, and I'll get empathy." Yep. No, a really setup. Like. No, I don't mean a setup by Trump. I'm talking about a setup. Like the Secret Service set up. No, no, no no set up. Don't look for conspiracies when they're not there. Some 20-year-old, barely out of his tweens, teens with mental health issues, took a shot at the president, and the Secret Service was disgraceful. That's all it is. No more than that. Don't go looking for conspiracies. I agree with Joe. It's an incompetence issue. I'm sorry it happened, but I don't see a conspiracy there. Next time I talk to you guys, I'll be live in Chicago, God willing. (laughs) <laughs> How's the birth rate in Chicago? Yeah, we got to talk about birth rate. You guys, you guys control the agenda. You talk about whatever, every, every you want. All right, John Frederick's right. Media hey, Network listen. next week. Birth rate, just, just open with that, guys. Bring back I the forget. birth rate. All right, guys. Birth rate.